Hi, everyone. So I have two disclaimers to make in this talk. So the first one is that I'm actually be criticizing a bit of JavaScript at a JavaScript conference. And the second one is that it's my first talk. So you have to thank you. So these two things means you'll have to be extra patient with me. So my talk is going to begin with an anecdote about how I was writing a very simple function. So I was working on this project, which was for managing time off for employees. So we basically had to display in some kind of table when employees were starting the, their vacations. So it was basically coming down to writing this simple function, which we would take a list of employees and get their starting vacation date for each one. And this, of course, worked great for a few days until someone made some changes I was not aware of. And I was starting to get errors like this. Um, so at this point, I made what I think most lazy programmers do, which is start adding some defensive checks. So we had this function, and now we're just checking that employees was defined. I, I'm sure most of you have done this at some point. So again, we had this, and obviously, sometime later, we get cannot read property blah of null. So someone was passing an array, but it had the wrong kind of thing. So at this point, I'm pretty tired of this, so I got basically every check I can. So our function starts to look like this. We check if employees is defined, and we check that each employee is defined and has this method, and only then we call it. And just in case if everything fails, we add that we are going to return an empty array. So this is kind of what our function looks like now. <laughs> so we're just pretending that whatever we're getting is fine, when obviously it's not. But again, we're not too proud of our code, but we're pretty sure that it should work now. Obviously, two hours later, we get a call from QA, and it tells us that while the table is rendering, it's rendering blanks for the dates. And just to prove them wrong, we find this line, we plug our debugger, and obviously, we get this. <laughs> so at this point, I'm sort of like this. And it actually made me question my relationship with JavaScript until I could admit it to myself. So I was like, I love you, JavaScript, but we have a problem. <laughs> well, you have a problem. Or rather, many problems. <laughs> so welcome to my talk. This is called Beyond JavaScript, the, the Languages for the Modern Web. And it's a story about how I went out and discovered new languages to write front-end applications. So the first obvious choice is, of course, TypeScript. So TypeScript, as most of you might know, is a type superset of JavaScript. This means that every JS program is a valid TypeScript program. And this allows us to slowly add types to our programs to start gaining some of the benefits, to start catching some of the mistakes before we're at production. So if we go back to our original example, the, the top function is what we wanted to write, and the bottom one is what we had to because we couldn't control what people were doing with it. So in TypeScript, there's a simple solution. So first, we define a type for employees. In this case, it's just going to be an object with the required get vacation date method. And notice uh, that in the implementation of our function, the body didn't change at all. We just added some annotations for the arguments and the return type. And so if we go and check the cases that were breaking our function, like passing null or passing an array with um, malformed objects, there are going to be compile time errors. So TypeScript is going to know that, and they're not gonna, they're gonna, it's going to reject our program because it has the wrong types. So we don't actually have to go and, and test it out in the browser to get sure it works. Um, so 
just to talk a bit more about TypeScript, I think it's a great solution when you have a, an existing JavaScript code base and you want to start adding some types, getting some of these benefits, or when you want to um, start adding new features with a bit more safety when refactoring, stuff like that. But I was not convinced it was the best solution for when starting a, a new app. I thought maybe there were other choices that could get us a better return. And to talk about some of the problems, um, being a superset of JavaScript means it carries many of the quirks and problems of it. Um, also, it has a really complex or rather complicated type system because it has to accommodate to all the patterns we use in JavaScript. And we do some crazy things with it. We sometimes we have a function that sometimes returns an array, sometimes returns numbers. Um, and this means that types in TypeScript sometimes can get really hard to understand, to write, and to read. Because of this, we have a relatively weak type inference. So type inference is the ability of the compiler to automatically uh, detect and assign types to our program so that we can save up some annotations. But in TypeScript, that breaks quite e easily if we use some of the advanced features of the language. And finally, this is improving a bit uh, recently, but it usually has some pretty ugly error messages. So when we're doing something wrong, it's kind of hard to correct. So this prompted me to investigate more languages, and I found out that there are lots. So this is just a bit of a list I found on GitHub of languages that compile to, to JavaScript nowadays. So I picked two to talk about today, which I find, found really interesting. Um, the first is going to be Clojure, or ClojureScript, which is a language that encourages functional programming. It has immutable data structures by default with opt-in mutability. It is a dialect of Lisp. And it really has great tooling, and it's been battle tested for years on the server side. Um, so it compiles both to JavaScript and JVM bytecode, so it's really super fast. So one of the crazy things about Clojure is that it has really minimal syntax. This is basically all you need to know to start writing the language. So here I have some examples. Um, the first one is a function call. So to call a function, you simply open parentheses, type the name of the function, and the argument separated by spaces. The second one is calling the same function with more arguments. We're defining a constant. We're defining um, a new function. And finally, we're defining a list. So Clojure has this crazy property that if we look at how we define lists, it's pretty much the same as how we um, make a function call. So the only difference is that for a function call, we require that the first element in this space separated things inside parentheses is a function. But apart from that, Clojure gives, the, gives us this ability to kind of seamlessly think of code as data, as data as code. So if we look at this deeper, we'll see that this expression, we can kind of think about it like the blue side uh, down as being calling the function plus with three and four. By the way, Clojure uses prefix notation for everything. Um, or we can think of it as a list, which has the first argument, uh, sorry, the first element being a function, and the other elements being the numbers three and four. So this is pretty mind blowing. And this is actually one of the um, core things that back a, a very powerful system of macros, of metaprogramming. So we can use this in Clojure to write code that writes code. Um, so I would really love to um, get into details about this and uh, show some examples, but I don't have enough time. I really recommend you read this uh, blog post uh, about, um, sorry, by Paul Graham, which is a co-founder of Y Combinator in which he explains how he used another dialect of Lisp to beat their competitors by being able to deliver tech faster and better. And he explains some of the use cases for these metaprogramming features. And so now I want to 
talk a bit about Elm. Elm is a programming language. It's also a functional language which has static types. It is immutable only, which means there is absolutely no mutability in the language. All functions are pure. It obviously compares to JavaScript. And here's one of the most interesting things, is that it has no exceptions, no runtime errors, and null and undefined simply don't exist. Um, so to get a bit familiar with the syntax, here we have how, would you, how you define an if expression in ARM. So everything is, is an expression in ARM. That means that everything has to evaluate to some value. So for example, an if expression always have to, has to have an else branch, because if the condition is false, it has to return something. And that's why it's more similar to, say, the ternary operator in JavaScript than the if statement. And then we have how you define a function. So you'll notice there's no function keyword or anything like that. And arguments are separated by spaces, both for calling and defining functions. This one only returns its argument multiplied by 42. And so um, let me say, as I said, a language is specifically built for uh, writing uh, single page applications. Um, and like React, it uses a virtual DOM for rendering HTML. But contrary to React, we have no special syntax for actually um, rendering these, these nodes. All we have are functions. We'll see, for example, in the app function, which in React we're using this uh, component, which only has, which only displays a div with an h1 and this custom component. In now, um, it's just a function div which takes two lists, the first one being the list of attributes. Here we're giving it a CSS class of app, and the other list is the list of children. These, of course, both are equivalent and both render this super cool app. <laughs> so um, before diving in, into the code, um, to talk about a bit about this, which is ELM um, has a standardized way of building applications, which is called the ELM um, architecture. Um, so if you use Redux or something like that, this is completely similar. Um, in fact, uh, some of those libraries are based in part on, on this, um, where we have a view function, which is a, a function which takes the current state of the world, that is called the model, and returns some HTML. We have messages, which are like Redux actions, and we have an update function that, given the message that was triggered and the current state of the world, returns a new, uh, the new state. So for example, here's a quick um, show of how you define these four things. Um, this is a, a simple, simple counter application. So um, we're defining a initial model which is just an integer, it's going to be the number zero. We're defining the types of messages we can trigger, which are going to be increment and decrement. And in our update function, we handle what happens with those cases. In the cases of increment, we're just returning the model plus one. In the case of decrement, we're decremented by one the model. And finally, our view, um, it's going to be just a div, which renders three elements. A button with a text of minus that's going to um, reduce our counter, and we're doing that by binding this uh, event handler. So that's saying that whenever the button is clicked, it's going to trigger the message decrement. And the other um, button is pretty much the same thing. So if we actually go and check this up, this is exactly the same code. Uh, we have our simple counter up. Yay! <laughs> um, so what it's very interesting about um, is that it, um, it uses the compiler not as a program built to yell at you when you're wrong, but more like an assistant when coding. When coding. So I want to show it about how coding uh, feels like in Elm. So we've got this simple application, which is the to-do MVC app. Um, You'll notice here that it has the common completed and active filters. So now we get that requirements have changed, and we actually 
don't want to show that anymore, but want to show filters for when tasks are hard and when tasks are, are easy. And for management, they tell us that a task is hard when it has a description longer than 15 characters. OK. So we go ahead and implement this. So it's not necessary that you um, understand the syntax, but the process. So I happen to know that here I'm defining this type, oops, which shows me um, which are the filters that I can have in my application. So that's the first thing I'm going to do. Oops. Um, so I'm going to change completed by complex, which are going to be hard tasks, and incomplete by simple. So I just say that, and I'm going to let the compiler guide me. So I'm going to go and fix um, line by line what it tells me is wrong. So it says line 78, I cannot find this thing. These names seem close enough. OK, so I, think I see complex, which is what I want. Change it. And this is how I'm going to render it. I'm going to render it as hard. Now it's not finding incomplete. Again, I'm going to change it to simple. I'm going to render as easy. Again, I have a similar error, a line 303. This is simple. And here's when I'm going to be handling the logic of how, um, when I actually want to render a to do uh, when the filter is simple. So, as I said, oops, so I screwed up. Uh, oh. um, so, as I said, I want to, when the filter is simple, I want to render that to do only if its um, description is, has less than of equal to 15 characters. So, I'm going to take the list, um, the length of the description. I'm going to check this. I'm going to save, and I'm going to keep fixing my errors. So what happens if I get some typos in here? OK, um, the error's good enough. Could be a bit better, but if I do this, oh, I still have some other errors. Um, so this is um, a funny example because this is um, what URL I'm getting uh, when I switch to some filter. For example, when I was in the incomplete filter, I was uh, in the slash active URL. This is something that perhaps could have been pretty easy, to, pretty hard to spot if I didn't have these um, kind of checks. OK, so now it's giving me the error about the typo that I got before. So this, this um, message is actually fantastic because it says, this to the record does not have a this description field. This is usually a typo. Here are the to-do fields that are most similar. And finally, it says, so maybe description should be description. And that's exactly what I want. So I go ahead. I change this. One funny thing is that I have never uh, gone into my browser yet. OK, so now finally it compiles successfully. So I go and I'm going to check. OK, it says hard. It works. It says easy. It works. Yay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so this is just a bit of the experience you get when you have a really helpful compiler. Um, I recommend uh, seeing that talk I linked, which compares um, even more the experience of Elm uh, versus React, um, which is pretty interesting. And finally, I, I want to talk about some of the things that I missed, uh, which is that Elm is lightning fast. This is um, kind of outdated, but um, some versions ago, at least, Elm was faster than any major JavaScript framework. So that's pretty interesting. And it's super lightweight. So this is the size of the real world app. And this is in part because um, as Elm has only pure functions, 
doing things like tree shaking is extremely easy, and you can tree shake and uh, eliminate a lot of code. Um, some other interesting things um, that Elm has is that it has out of the box support for building, bundling, time travel debugging, etc. And this is actually super cool that it has automatically um, enforced semantic versioning. So when you um, when you're publishing a new package version, the compiler is going to check that uh, you didn't change any of the publicly ex exported functions, that you didn't change any of the types, and if you do, it's going to tell you this is a ma major change, so you have to bump, bump that version. So upgrading dependencies is super safe. Um, so that's pretty much all I had. Um, Finally, a um, few words about myself. Um, I'm a consultant. I really love functional programming, and I think it can improve uh, the world of software development. So I do consulting on Haskell and on Scala. So if you're interested in that, please come talk to me. And that's it. Thank you very much.